Okay, I think we'll get started if that's okay. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Yes. Great. Good news. Um, so hi and welcome to the third in our series of Edinburgh Lectures in Language Evolution for 2023. Uh, we've heard two fantastic talks already this series from Steve Cantadosi on large language models. And oh, then it's a bit of a Let me try that again, folks. <laughs> We've heard two fantastic talks this year uh, in this series from Steve Cantadosi on large language models and from Isabel Dautriche on semantic computations in primates. And I just want to say a huge thanks from the committee. That's myself, Maisie Hallam, Henry Conklin, uh, Sidel D'Souza and Ponrawi Prasotsam. Thank you so much for attending our events and for all of your wonderful questions and feedback. Um, if you missed any of the previous talks, they are available to watch on YouTube streams. Uh, they are still available on YouTube and I have been circulating links for those um, and I will circulate them again as we come to the end of these talks. So today though, I have the absolute privilege of introducing to you our third speaker, Balthazar Bickel, who will be speaking on the before, the during and the after of biases in language evolution. Balthazar is the Chair of General Linguistics at the University of Zurich in Switzerland. He leads the Distributional Linguistics Lab there and also serves as Director of the National Centre for Competence in Research for Evolving Language. Balthazar describes his research with an absolutely lovely turn of phrase, very succinct, what's where why in language. So what kinds of structures do we see in the world's languages? Where are they distributed? And why did language evolve to have those structures? In other words, he takes an evolutionary perspective on morphosyntactic and phonological regularities in language. And like we at the CLE, he's interested in explanations from production and comprehension of language. But he's also interested in demographic and geographical explanations, such as how local popula population histories affect language change. Balthazar is also known <laughs> for his fieldwork in the Himalayas uh, and for documenting morphosyntactic regularities in Piranti languages as well as for building a corpus for the endangered language, Chintai. And just before I hand over to you, I just want to remind our audience online uh, to please ask questions in the Q&A box on Zoom. Uh, and if you don't have a question, then please look at the other questions and upvote the ones that you find interesting so we can ask them to our panel at the end. Uh, and so with that, I will let you take it away, Balthazar. Thanks for the invitation and uh, thanks for the great uh, introduction. Um, I hope I can live up to the uh, promises. Um, let me now share my screen. Um, let's see. I hope this works. Um, do you all see the uh, my first slide with the title? Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, I want to talk about uh, biases in language evolution, and my point of departure is something that I find um, is one of the most exciting and also most uh, difficult uh, properties of the human language faculty, and that is its gigantic uh, and relentless diversification. If you compare uh, uh, our language with uh, communication systems in other primates, be it uh, old world monkeys like Campbell monkeys on the left or new world monkeys like the uh, Calitrickets uh, in the center or uh, great apes uh, on the right, there is evidence for slight variation in vocalizations uh, between subpopulations. Uh, there is uh, also some evidence for accommodation when uh, populations come together, so some relearning adjustments. Are, but it all pales. It pales heavily compared to the diversity that we have in human language. And uh, just a map here with the impressions of like all the different languages that have. We are 7,000 currently, roughly. Um, now, one could easily say, well, but hey, we also have many more humans on the planet, so naturally we have more. And, you know, if we had, you know, as many 
uh, chimps on the planet, um, then we might have just as many chip vocal vocalization systems. But I think the problem or this, uh, the, the fact of diversity sits deeper. Uh, all current research on earliest uh, cultural activities in our species point to great diversification right from the start. Even like at the earliest times of Homo sapiens archaeological records in Africa, you find diversity in tool making procedures, uh, in any artifact you find in okra use and whatnot, you find diversity right from the start and you find it widespread. Um, uh, you, what the picture is like different uh, subpopulations interlinked in exchange, but all producing diversity of expression. So there is a suggestion that there is something fundamental to our species in seeking diversification to an extent that we do not share. Uh, that we do not find um, in other primates. So what has happened? Uh, nobody really knows, of course, but uh, clearly uh, what seems to be the case and, uh, is that we started out, and I'm starting out here in the left upper corner, I will explain what this displays. We start out with a system where communication systems evolve just as a phenotype property of each species. So a fundamental change in the communication system sort of has to wait, wait for a new species to emerge through regular process of biological evolution. That's the capital B here is meant to represent biological evolution. It lives from this interaction of phenotypes and genotypes in very complex ways and developmental constraints and so on and so forth, and niche construction and what else. But the point is that fundamental difference in communication systems rely on that biological evolutionary process to happen. And uh, at some point in the hominin lineage, um, we changed from this to a system which uh, shows diversity of a very different kind, one that is characterized by an almost oscillatory behavior in the sense that when languages change from one state to the other, it's not like I know you 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 when go to a new state and then when you are there you you build on that and you go further and so forth. No, um, individual features change back and forth in human history. You go from OV order to VO order. You have a certain sound, you lose it, and you find this all over. What has been successful in characterizing um, language change in that sense are ergodic model models, models that assume that any state in the state space of the human la language faculty can be reached in fin finite, uh, although radically varying diverse uh, times. Since it's ergodic, it also means that it settles at some point in the stationary distributions where the total frequencies don't change anymore. We have like you, 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 you know, you settle, converge on a certain probability of uh, states. Um, <clears throat> and this is on the top uh, right corner, uh, L for language change or linguistic evolution. Uh, it can go further, it can go into cultural evolution, uh, for instance, technological evolution, like writing, or these days, more importantly, neuroengineering, artificial intelligence. I think this is something that uh, Steve talked about in the first talk of the series, and then won't, won't go into it. Um, but the critical point is that in linguistic evolution, you do not have radically new forms. You have a state space that's sort of fixed for the entire species, uh, for most of its properties. And uh, you can reach a certain state, but you go back from it after, if you wait long enough. It's not fixed. And it is no radical innovation anymore. And this is, in a way, fantastic, because it means it gives us a way of characterizing the language phenotype at the species level in a straightforward way. All that we need to do is to sample linguistic phylogenies, cases of language history, and estimate models of ergodic change, compute out the stationary probability distribution. There we go. Then we know what's more, what's preferred uh, or what, what uh, in the language faculty. And so we can characterize the language faculty at the species level uh, in all its dynamic, not just as a set, a snapshot of what we find here, but really capturing what characterizes it as a relentlessly diversifying system, very different from a standard primate communication system. So this is the good news. And uh, we, there is progress in this. Um, uh, 
For, for example, uh, a wonderful paper recently by Gerhard Jäger and uh, Wale, where they used um, these kinds of models. Uh, it's fairly straightforward Markov chain models, fitted them not on one phylogeny, but on as many as they got their hands on, the whole forest of phylogenies. Estimated transition rates from that to stationary probability distributions, and therefore, and with that, found um, some very decisive trends um, in the posterior distribution. So, on the bottom row, for instance, this um, association between word order of the verb and object and the subject and the uh, verb and object and, and subject and verb and, and, and whatnot, um, with uh, uh, striking evidence. So good, we think we can characterize the language faculty, we have the methods, but we have a serious data problem. And the data problem is this. What you see here is a, a, a map of the world's languages whereby the same color, exactly the same color means that the dots are from the same language family. So in Africa, that's Atlantic, Congo. Uh, now the green in Africa and Southeast Asia is different greens. Uh, it's just like there is a, uh, we don't have enough colors in the universe to go capture everything. Uh, so it's a different, there's Austronesian, uh, different language family. Uh, but then you have Indo-European in this, uh, I don't know how to characterize this uh, color, but some beige-like uh, thing. Uh, so these are the same families. What this already tells you is that, wow, well, we had this gigantic spreads of some families that swiped away, that brushed away gigantic diversity that must have been there. Africa is the most extreme case, probably, because clearly there were hundreds and hundreds of different languages before these large spreads that you know uh, uh, destroyed the diversity was there. What the map also shows you is that when colors are similar to each other, this means that they are similar in typological space. Uh, they, these are This is the result of a principal component analysis of the proportion of typological features in language families. So if two language families are similar with each other in their typological makeup in the kinds of structures they have, they will have similar colors. So the map shows you something beyond just the spreads of families. It also shows you the spread of features. So for example, in Eurasia, you tend to have more similar colors within Eurasia than say compared to Africa, which suggests that there is something spread independently of the families, namely the characteristics of the, of the languages, which means also that the distribution of the type frequencies of what kinds of languages you have there is reduced. It became assimilated. You have a flattening of the, of the diversity to a great extent. You don't have that as much as in the Americas, especially in, the, in the, uh, uh, North America on the coast. They have great diversity that's there, um, arguably because not many of these great spreads happened after the settlement of the Americas. But you have them in uh, Eurasia to a great extent. And then of course, Australia one big language family and very similar, uh, for example, in its phonological profile. So, and even be in, for that, even beyond the family. And now this is all you could say, speculating why the distribution of the features is the way they are, but we have case studies where actually we know that this was driven by population history, by the history of how people shared uh, their history, were in contact, uh, indeed formed the same gene pool at some time, uh, were really interlinked with each other over time. We have evidence for this. Uh, here is a case study we did a few, few years ago on Northeast Eurasia, where you have uh, different language families. So most of them represented only by a long, one language because there is no other, it's isolates like Ainu, uh, for example. Um, and uh, we know from the lexicon, they are all maximally distinct from each other. They don't form families. That's the, uh, there's no way one could group them into a larger, they're really different families. But what we found is that if you look at the distribution of grammatical features across these families, they reflect the 
genetic distance between the populations of the speakers. It's in fact the only robust correlation that we found. We compared this to the distribution of musical features, of chronological features, but it is really grammar that stands out. I take this as a case that shows that uh, early population history, here clearly older than the language families, otherwise we would detect the language families, that early population history leaves a trace in the distribution features over in this case, probably more than 10,000 years. So contact, population history can reshape and continue to shape both in earlier times and in more recent times, the distribution of features. And this can go far. Um, in a recent study, we looked at the extent to which we can recover early contact and population history scenarios in the ancient Near East, the area on Earth where we have the oldest written record, so we know most about languages from, the, uh, from any uh, earlier than anywhere else at the same extent. We used a, 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 a Bayesian uh, a mixture model that sought out to see which feature distributions cannot be explained by either common ancestry in the linguistic history, so by phylogeny, trees, language family trees, nor by universal preferences like the global distributions of features. What emerged was puzzling and striking. The only area we found was between Hurrian and Sumerian. That's two languages that cannot possibly have influenced each other through contact. The timing doesn't work out. The suggestion why they share similarities, unlike the, uh, the languages around them, which are different, the Semitic languages, for example. The explanation we propose is that they in fact reflect uh, a distribution of features that is more ancient than the one that we see in the surrounding families. So they are the remnants, that's a speculative claim, but they are the remnants of a large area that reflects joint population history, the signal of which got swamped away by more recent spreads, specifically in this area by the spreads of the uh, uh, Afroasiatic language family, notably Semitic. Some evidence for this is that you find the similar features that you now see in Hurrian and Sumerian, you find them in some uh, pockets of Eurasia that have been exempt from the large spreads, that is the mountain areas in the Caucasus and the Himalayas. Joanna Nichols and I have argued for this uh, based on, on the different uh, evidence in the past, um, but it's clearly, we cannot prove it, it's, it's uh, a suggestion. What I, I want, why do I emphasize this? I want to emphasize this because I want to, you know, um, create distrust. I want us to stop believing in the data distributions we see these days. And I want to exemplify this with the following map. This is a map of whether languages put the agent before the patient or have subject first, or the patient before the agent or object first, if you wish and languages that are variable or split with that regard. This comes straight out of, the, out of the World Atlas of Language Structures. And most linguists these days, when looking at the map like this, would say, oh, yeah, there you go. Subject initial dominates. That must be something that's preferred. I think Isabel went into this uh, last week and mentioned it very briefly, um, because it is indeed the standard thing that everybody would uh, immediately subscribe to. But I hope after you have seen what I showed you about the impact of large spreads of both languages and features and the depth of that this can have in time, uh, we should be doubtful about this. It, there is no way we, next, we can exclude, for example, that before the Bantu expansions, Africa was all red, all object initial. Look at the Americas, North America, lots of object initial patterns, Australia, same. Um, it could be that maybe in the Paleolithic, the Nilotic languages, that type already dominated the world. Um, we cannot exclude this. In fact, we should probably even think this might be the case because um, uh, from, uh, for example, Susan Goldie Meadows' work, um, it, is, uh, an, it, it uh, emerged that um, uh, home signers who have no linguistic input actually spontaneously produced many more object initial 
utterances than subject initial utterances. This is a point that she's made about 20 years ago where um, the spontaneous structures would be more like snack eat you rather than you eat snack as we would have it in the subject initial languages. And this was recently confirmed by research on uh, emerging sign languages by Irit Meyer's group, where they showed that um, you have, uh, uh, especially when it comes to human reference, that they usually go first, even when they are objects, right? So that's in the, in the lower graph B here, when the referent uh, is human in an object function, so a patient, then it tends to be uttered first, just as often as the subject would be mentioned first. So there is no clear bias towards putting agents first uh, in these emergent languages. So that um, I hope I have convinced you that we shouldn't trust the counts that we see on the maps. That's all I want to say, right? But the evidence is really uh, disturbing. So we have just to, uh, conclude this part, we, we started out with saying, hey, we have great methods now to actually estimate the, the dynamic of the language phenotype, because we have these wonderful methods of estimating the dynamics uh, in language families, we can do this, but the data are a problem, because what we see now is a snapshot that might not at all be representative of the languages that characterize or have characterized our species over the 300,000 years of its history. Not at all. It's just a tiny snapshot. So what can we do? What I'm proposing is that the, the, the only hope uh, I at least have, maybe others have others hope, but other hopes, but my hope is that uh, we can rely on the converging of evidence from different kinds in order to characterize the language faculty and its dynamics more properly. Uh, and what I'm aiming at in, also that sort of characterizes to some extent what we do in, uh, in my group in Zurich. We try to combine uh, evidence on universal mechanisms in language processing, uh, both comprehension and production and language learning or learning how to process and to produce with evidence from phylogenetic modeling. And in both cases, the aim is doing this universally in the sense that no experiment would really convince me if it was run only with uh, some population in Europe. It has to be replicated all over. It has to be replicated uh, in very different uh, linguistic and cultural settings. So uh, for example, an agent preference will convince me if it's replicated in a, in a patient initial language, an example I will get to. At the same time, that evidence is of little interest for linguistic evolution and for characterizing the language phenotype, really, if it is not already also shown in the dynamics of how languages change over time. If it doesn't leave a trace in language, why should we care? Then it's a characterization of the human brain, which is super interesting and fantastic, but has little to do with the phenotype of language. So we need both. We need uh, uh, research on the precise mechanisms that uh, make our faculty possible that operate that make it that operate it and at the same time we need uh, phylogenetic models and estimates of um, dist stationary distributions and change dynamics um, uh, worldwide it, once we have done this then we can go to other animals and say like is this system that we found in in humans uh, their little thing in the middle uh, how does it compare to other uh, primates now, what I want to do in the in the in this talk in the rest um, is uh, well, I selected just very few uh, examples, case studies where I think we have made some pro progress. I think we, we have others, but I want to focus on three, and I picked the three because uh, the first one illustrates, uh, or at least that is what I want to suggest, something that has evolved before language emerged and that keeps shaping language. Then I want to talk about something where I feel really uncertain, but I, I'm eager to hear opinions uh, about something that was maybe not, did not evolve before, but was boosted by language or got like a big um, um, uh, change, underwent change when language emerged. And the third one uh, uh, I selected to demonstrate or to make clear that the uh, mechanisms that shape language, um, they keep evolving. They haven't stopped 300,000 years ago because our bio biology didn't stop then. Uh, we keep changing. 
also on that side. So it's really this combination between evidence from the biological side and the linguistic dynamic sides, the uh, linguistic language change side, uh, together uh, that I think we need in order to learn something about the language phenotype at the species level, and uh, where really I take the, the temporal dynamics to be one of the core properties to be explained because it so strikingly differs from other primates. So the first example I want to talk about is what I call the animate agent preference. It is a bit similar to what Isabel mentioned last time with the agent preference, but the, the notion animate agent preference is uh, very important to me because I will argue that there's actually a much more specific uh, principle than um, what I also myself used to think. I think we have now evidence for something more specific. So what do I mean? What do I talk about? I, I start from processing. I start from a comprehension pattern. And the comprehension pattern is um, so one that has been discovered over 20 years ago with electrophysiological experiments on sentence pairs uh, like these, where you have in German here, both uh, verb final constructions uh, 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 translated in one case, in the red case, where Eva is the agent, and in the second, the blue case, where Eva is the patient. You know this only when you hit the verb. Uh, in the first case, Eva allegico ist hat, that's a singular form, and it, uh, we know the verb agrees with the agent in transitive sentences, and so Eva must have been the agent, you know that then. And in the second case with haben is a plural form, so we, it's clear that Eva cannot have been the agent. In fact, alle, everybody must have been the agent. So at, at that position, it becomes clear what the sentence mean, namely that Eva is a patient. It's been observed that in the blue case, there is a, a electrophysiologically detectable signal, a so-called N400, uh, which is uh, usually associated with some reanalysis effect uh, or some surprisal effect. And indeed, that has been the question. What is behind this? Uh, one theory uh, that's been around for 20 years has said, well, this is really reanalysis because there is a very strong prior that the human processing system brings to a sentence comprehension, which expects an initial nominative, just an unmarked NP that could also be listed in the lexicon, um, or an unmarked NP should denote an agent. If it doesn't, bang, you get the problem, you reanalyze, you get the N400 deflection. Now, a concurrent theory says, oh, no, this has nothing to do with agent patient. It's simple, like at every single point in time, the brain reacts to the conditional probability that you encounter the next word. Uh, it makes predictions. That's what brains do. Um, and uh, this has been quantified in terms of surprisal uh, estimate, which can be estimated, for example, from large language models. Now, the question has been, which explains the data better, the electrophysiological data? Now, uh, we, or better, if our PhD student recently did this systematically by uh, uh, fitting models that try to explain um, the N400 in terms of its micro voltage uh, uh, signal, uh, either by assuming an agent prior or by uh, trying to predict everything from surprise. Um, we found that like the, the model that fits the date the best is one that needs that includes both uh, factors, both the surprisal and the prior expectations. Um, surprisal alone doesn't get you decent uh, predictive performance on the models. The agent preference alone doesn't do that either. Most strikingly, however, was a finding that even in, uh, I just picked the most extreme case, in Basque. In Basque, a nominative or absolute, if it's also called, denotes a patient. And we still got this N400 deflection. That's quite striking because it suggests that even though your language tells you should be a patient, the brain still reacts to that and throws the signal that seems to suggest actually expected an agent. Now, this experiment was possible because there's one case one situation where uh, the, the, the case ending is ambiguous between nominative and, and a marked case, a so-called archetype. But it's striking that you, even though there is this strong preference, you still get um, this effect from the prior expectation that uh, unmarked initial nominative should be an agent. Well, one could say, but 
in a way, no wonder in these languages, usually when you have all the arguments together, agent, patient, you put the agent first. And so maybe, you know, speakers get trained on the languages they are raised with. So maybe that's just, you know, what they expect. So we confronted this whole uh, uh, finding with the most extreme case imaginable. And uh, postdoc uh, in our group, Sebastian Sarpet, traveled to the Solomon Islands and did these experiments with speakers of an OVS language, that is a language that puts patients first. And um, examples are on top, the boy followed the man, so the old man, so the old man goes first, it's the patient, that's the canonical way of saying this, there's good arguments from the detailed uh, syntactic analysis that also Nas state that this is really the basic structure and everything else is derived. Um, the same you find with inanimate uh, uh, objects like the canoe uh, on the, in the second panel. The stats just show like this also goes with the probabilities in, in this course, what you find like NPs typically tend to be patients um, uh, the, uh, in, uh, in the initial position. What we found though was really interesting. When the uh, first element is human, you get the same pattern of an N400 deflection when you hit the verb and it becomes clear that it actually is a patient. So this is really striking. So everything in the language tells you the first noun phrase should be a patient. And still, when you look at ele electrophysiological response, when it is the patient, as you should expect, it still shows this N400 signal that it suggests that you get the same error analysis that we saw in German, Hindi, Basque, and many other languages that they didn't mention because they show basically the same pattern. Picture flipped when the first NP was inanimate. And there, the response was really apparently driven by surprise, right? So you have just the canoe, patient, yes, patient, and it turns, you get an N400 when it turns out to be an agent at the verb. So we also had examples where this was an agent and then you get the phenomenon. This is what you should expect if the brain was simply entrained on the input it received and uh, the, the language experience and the probability distributions that are there in the language. But on the left side panel, this is not, this cannot be explained by the, by the language. This suggests that there is something deep about a preference, a prior expectations that initial reference should denote an animate agent, not any, not any agent, an animate agent. The effort goes away when it's inanimate. Now, what is it? We looked further. Um, and we did with uh, Arate, another uh, PhD student uh, who's just finished now, um, uh, at visual gist apprehension, looking at uh, situations where viewers have to make quick decisions. By quick, I mean brief exposure. Brief exposure that are really fast, 300 milliseconds. I show you what this means. You see first a fixation mark and then a picture very quickly. This is it, it's very, very fast. So participants saw pictures at this speed and then had to undertake a decision task. In one, they had to describe what they saw in ver ver verbally. In another, they simply had to, to uh, recognize uh, the, the, the participants in the, in the scene. But it's decision tasks. What turned out, the, the, the result here is uh, striking. Um, we did this comparatively in two languages, but that's not what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about is that in both cases, across both tasks, speakers went for the agent. You know, the, uh, the proportion of fixations uh, as we tracked them with, with eye tracking uh, was way more on the agent than on anything else within 300 milliseconds. That's really fast, as you saw. So what this suggests is that there is a built-in prior uh, principle of making decisions about semantic roles, about event roles that privilege agents. The question is, could this be, and we addressed this in a review paper recently, could this be derived from a very general uh, principle of causality detection, detecting the causer of an event? Something that is uh, very widespread uh, in, in other animals. Isabel showed this uh, results from baboons uh, last time of detecting like the causing element, or in, in that case, it was a switch in the causing 
element as opposed to the cost element. Uh, it's also something that's uh, been demonstrated uh, for chicken, freshly hatched chicken, which have uh, uh, were imprinted as the Mascalzoni paper I cite here uh, from 10 years ago, uh, which were imprinted on uh, differently colored blocks. And then they just preferred the one that was like the, 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 the perceived causer of a subsequent action as displayed to the chicken. So this seems to be very, very widespread uh, causality action. But I think what we have here in language is much, much more specific because it's linked with this animacy uh, condition, as I uh, tried to show with the, with the data from the IVO language comprehension experiments. Can we find out what it is more specifically? To do so, we did experiments comparing great apes, orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees, and humans. We showed them that Sarah Brocker's dissertation work uh, now under review um, by displaying uh, short video clips where you have uh, uh, two uh, elements interacting with each other, manipulating the animacy of, on both sides. And then subjects had to press a button uh, where uh, uh, in preference what sort of they like best or what they where, where they would go for on the both conditions they got the reward so they could clearly um, do what they pleased. The results were super striking. Um, in the animate on inanimate condition, that's the leftmost panel. So where you have like situation like this, uh, 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 an animate doing something to an inanimate object in all participants, we had very strong, these are posterior probability estimates. We had a very strong preference for the agent. Everybody selected the agent. Nobody was really interested in the patient. Now you think, oh, maybe this is just like a preference for animates. You know, animates are just interesting. They, you know, they do stuff, inanimates are boring, but it can't be it because if it was just preference for animates, then in the third panel where you have an inanimate agent acting on an animate patient, you would expect preference for the animate patient. But no, we didn't see this in any species. In fact, children and chimpanzees went for the inanimate agent. This is a bit unexpected. We still don't know what happens. We speculate it has something to do with the interest in objects and tools in both these subpopulations, uh, but we don't know. But it's clearly a preference for animate agents and not just for animates. Animate on animate, the second panel, uh, is uh, uh, interesting in its own right, uh, because there the situation is clearly a bit ambiguous. Why should you, you know, it's not exactly the animate, it's the animate agent, but there is a competitor uh, in the situation. And what we found is that for human adults and orangutans, um, the agent preference, the preference for animate agents persisted. Uh, with uh, 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 more than 90% of the posterior probability mass favoring a choice of the agent, for the other species, the uh, preference disappeared. Nobody was particularly interested in the, in the inanimate uh, agent when it acted on an inanimate agent. So what this suggests to me that it's really a preference for animate agents, most discernible when the patient is inanimate, uh, but also for humans and orangutans, also when the patient was just as animate as the agent. Now, if that's so, could it be that there is just like, um, there's nothing to do with decision taking or priors on decision making, but just like in general, you know, um, everybody has an interest in tracking and observing agents or animate agents. Is it that? In order to find out, we did, and that's uh, uh, Vanessa Wilson's postdoc work, um, we, we used eye tracking to see to, to see what whether um, uh, different uh, populations we had babies uh, we had uh, gorillas uh, we had chimpanzees whether in eye tracking while watching a video you know the dynamics even not making decisions just watching with no task just watching whether they would prefer the agent or the patient. Uh, this was animated, but I, the video sort of broke, so let me jump to the results. What we found that in a first look at the two rightmost panels, when the object was inanimate uh, uh, or it was a social encounter, after controlling for differences in size and position and so forth, I should mention we also did the same control. So obviously when modeling the, the decision preferences in the earlier experiments, we do this standardly. But here, just looking at uh, 
fixations over time while watching the video, you see no preference, right? It's they, they look at both the agent and preference to roughly an equal extent. The odds are some somewhat one on one, so log odds of zero. It makes sense because you want to understand the action. There is no particular interest in one or the other. You want to understand the action. There was one striking finding that diverted, that was different, that diverged, and that is when the object was a food item. And then everybody was interested in the agent. But it's really specific to food, we found. And uh, there are possible ecological behavioral explanations for this about like, uh, it's important to watch what someone eats, right? Because there you learn what's edible or not, but we don't know, right? This is just a post uh, explanation. But what the findings here suggest is that we're not talking here about the general interest in agency. We're not talking here about the general interest in causality. That's much more widespread. Talking about the very specific interest in animate agents when you have to make a decision in a decision task. So choosing an agent after seeing a video, uh, pre predicting what the noun phrase means when he comes in, an agent, right? not the patient, an animate agent, right? Uh, it's much more specific. So to wrap up this section, uh, what I propose is that we have the animate agent preference is a, a resilient principle in language comprehension, specific to animate agents. It is completely independent of production preferences. That's why it holds up even in, in an OSV language where the production preference really puts patients first, not agents first. And it can be overridden for inanimate agents but only in uh, this most extreme case of IWO. In fact, there are other experiments that have looked at inanimate agents and they found that the preference actually spills over, but in IWO it doesn't. So it's not general causality to exceptions, it's specific expectation about animate agents. It's shared with other great apes, maybe with other primates, we don't know, the experiments haven't been done yet. And this is only the first part because that tells us now something about the potentially universally shared mechanism of processing both visual scenes and languages. Uh, but does it matter actually for language? I think it does because it shapes linguistic evolution. It drives languages uh, in such a way or language change in such a way that the uh, language prefer nominative, that is the lemma form, the unmarked form to denote agents and not patients. And uh, uh, a few years ago, we tested this with phylogenetic models on uh, many different language families around the world, controlling for population history in the sense of uh, contact areas, large areas. I display here one example of this. And in all uh, uh, macro areas, we tested this. And also if you go smaller in all areas, we tested this, you find that uh, the, the, the stationary dynamic of uh, language families favors a situation where the unmarked noun phrase, the nominative denotes an agent. So what we have here is a bias that evolved prior to language and that shapes uh, linguistic evolution uh, to the day. Uh, and uh, this is what I illustrates uh, for me what I said in the beginning, I think what we need in order to capture the language phenotype uh, in evolutionary perspective, it's converging evidence from these two lines of research. Now, I have to ask, uh, what is the, I actually didn't pay attention to the time. What's the, uh, what's the, uh, what did you guys uh, expect? Oh. You've got about um, 20 minutes left, 25 okay. minutes left. Okay, that's that's perfect. Uh, I won't take that long, but uh, then I don't, also don't have to uh, rush. So um, the second uh, case study um, that I wanted to share is one uh, where we start from the other side. Here we started from a finding in, in neurobiological processes uh, detectable in language comprehension. Here we started from a finding uh, more on the linguistic side, and uh, and and we aren't also we are not as far as uh, in the first case study, but I thought it interesting because it is uh, a hot topic, in, or has been a hot topic in linguistics. Uh, the the the, the self-similar embedding or recursive embedding, as some people uh, call it, but recursion has um, you know is a bit ambiguous in, in when it's used in the language sciences. Um, so. 
I probably don't need to say this, but uh, uh, this is uh, work with a po former postdoc in my group uh, uh, some years ago. There is this classical finding by Dan Everett, um, where he showed that you know in, in Biraha you can have uh, a one-layer uh, combination, a modification structure, sort of uh, 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 genitival con uh, construction, but you can have, not have it twice, right? You can do it once, but not twice. So you cannot self-similar embed more than once. Now, when this came up, I thought, well, it's actually not that exotic. I mean, in, in Russian, for instance, not very exotic language, that same is true with, uh, 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 it's, it's different, for instance, with genitives, um, you can do these two things, the mother spoke and Ivan's mother spoke, but just adding the genitive to each case. But the expression there, kniga mama, is not a colloquial Russian. What you would say in colloquial Russian is something different with a different suffix that's a so-called adjectivalizer that turns mama into an adjective and does otherwise the same purpose, has pretty much the same meaning, it's just more preferred. In this construction, you can't do it. It's like Biraha. So nothing exotic there, it happens. In fact, it happens uh, all over. If you're looking in European, sometimes, you know, you have a case marker or a preposition or the SFA construction and whatnot. And you trace what you find in historical records. Sometimes these things allow you to do this self-similar embedding and sometimes they don't. So unavailable means you cannot do the self-similar embedding. Available means you can do it with that. And things change, and they change really quite uh, back and forth. Um, so here is the history of Indo-Aryan, you know, limit to this one uh, thing. We start out with Vedic Sanskrit, where you use genitives to construct uh, these uh, uh, constructions where the horse meat requests, you know, where just like one modifies the hierarchical. The next one, you need the genitive. In classical Sanskrit, you don't. You just juxtapose. It's like compounding in English. So classical Sanskrit here is just like English or German or you know all these languages love these big heavy compounds. Um, uh, this stayed on in Singhala. You can still order your chicken meat curry as you would do in English, just like putting the roots one next to the other in a compound. But you can't do this in Nepali anymore. This is ungrammatical. You have to use genitives. So first genitives, then no genitives, then genitives again for doing self-similar embedding at at least two levels or recursion, right? So you need um, uh, this other um, uh, uh, construction. So we surveyed this uh, at the large scale in, in the European. Uh, the, each column here uh, is one type of marking, uh, uh, noun phrase uh, embedding. Uh, with a G genitive, A adjectivalizer, H ad marking, and so forth, different types of doing it. We, we saw some illustrated. We modeled this in the standard way that I mentioned before. We looked at like uh, the going back and forth, the, the, the we applied simple binary Markov chains, whether or not the given construction can be used for self-similar embedding or not. Right? Then you saw the history <clears throat> in Indoarian. We saw the examples in Russians where with one construction it goes, with the other it doesn't go. Uh, we reconstructed the probabilities uh, of uh, the availability of these uh, structural strategies over time. Uh, if you have a Markov chain model for language change of the kind that's displayed here, you can easily compute the probabilities that a certain state was uh, there or not over time, over the entire history of the family. This is not done on a single tree. This is done on posterior samples of, uh, of trees estimated based on lexical cognacy data independently of this research. What we <clears throat> afterwards did is we computed for each 30 year time span in the history of the family over all the samples of the trees, the probability that the given construction was available for self-similar embedding that goes at least two steps down or is recursive in that sense. <clears throat> it changes from construction to construction, but the most interesting thing, was it ever lost? Was in European ever Piraha? 
I that is completely uh, lost this. No, the probability of having at least one of these constructions available was always very high. It was always above 90%. So there's a very strong asymmetry, a strong bias for Indo European to always have allowed the self similar embedding. At least one of the strategies seems to have been available. Now we don't know whether this scales to other language families, I suspect it does, but the research has not been done yet. Now, what do we have here? Do we have here a bias towards self-similar embedding, a bias towards recursive syntax as maybe something deep uh, in the human language faculty? Not the principle, a bias, a probabilistic bias that has effects over time. Well, one thing that we looked at is, uh, or that we're actually <clears throat> more uh, deeply looking at uh, right now, is whether this could be reduced to a general principle, a general bias that uh, Tecumseh Fitch and others have called dendrophilia, like a propensity to have structures that are trees in language, and not any trees, but really supraregular trees where the branching can go in either direction, uh, forwards and backwards and crossing and whatnot, really complicated trees, dendrophilia. In order to test whether this could be a more general principle, we switched gears and looked at the different type of uh, constructions, namely class language constructions. And we took uh, a somewhat unorthodox or, uh, uh, view because we uh, started to code class linkage constructions. This is called the Minotis, uh, uh, dissertation work, where we, we, we coded uh, uh, class linkage constructions for the kinds of constraints that are opposed, uh, uh, imposed on them. So for example, whether or not you have a co-reference constraint, right? So that in this uh, complicated structure, there is a co-reference constraint that the, the subject of the gerund has to correspond to the subject of the main class. There are tense constraints, there are ordering constraints and whatnot. Created a database uh, coding uh, the construct the constraints that apply to different constructions in languages from the three different families, and then modeled the probability uh, or the, the probability or the well uh, yeah the probability that uh, construction uh, um, uh, or the amount of the, the, the proportion uh, of the constraints that apply to all constructions uh, in a language at the given point in time synchronically right now. Uh, we modeled this uh, uh, logistically, trying to, to reach just the binomial probability of uh, having these uh, constraints on class linkage transcriptions, given all the constructions that the language have and all the constraints that the language has. Uh, modeled this as a binomial uh, 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 likelihood um, and uh, uh, determined by uh, a phylogenetic model where the uh, on the log odd scale, uh, this can go from, from just from minus infinity to plus infinity. And we've compared two models where the parameter evolved according to Brown in motion, which means like it can fill the probability space uh, just completely, or whether it's driven by a, a, a model with an attractor state, the nornstein uhlenbeck model, where you have a convergent state, a stationary state, uh, which is preferred and where languages converge to. What we found in model comparison is that the model with the nornstein uhlenbeck attractor won out. These are simulations, and I will quickly walk through them. Uh, we're not interested in here in reconstructing ancestral languages. We are interested in the parameter values, and we thought it's best to visualize them by, by simulating the process that we estimated. Uh, what you have here on the x-axis is the proportion of time in each family. The languages have language families have different time depths, so this is just proportional. On the y-axis, you have the constraint probability, so now on the response scale. And we found that there is an optimum in each of the three language families, one, uh, two in uh, Eurasia, one in South America, two in Guarani, that is below 50%. It's about between uh, one quarter or the one third. Uh, so only one quarter or one third of the constraints apply to uh, class language. Under the extreme, then under dendrophilia, I would expect actually that languages 
would prefer higher values, that you would go for uh, more constraints, more constructional regulation, more grammar, because in order to get decent complex trees under dendrophilia, you need quite a bit of grammatical machinery to get this in place. You need constraints. But languages over time seem to avoid this. What do the, uh, the simulations show? Uh, we don't reconstruct. So we simulate what would happen if Proto-Indo-European had everything super constrained. So starting with a constraint probability of one or nothing constrained, starting with just pure juxtaposition that's been speculated over 200 years, you know, Proto-Indo-European just juxtaposing sentences, no complex sentence. Yeah, these are speculative hypotheses. But the critical point is that no matter what you assume for the proto-language, the process converges relatively quickly after half of the time of the family history. So about 4,000, 5,000, 4, years, you converge on uh, the stationary probability, uh, which is in the European case, only one quarter. So in, in Sino-Tibetan, the, the, the variance is quite a bit larger. Um, so there is uh, quite some variation going on, still will continue to go on. The, the, these processes allow variation. They are modeled this way. Uh, so there will be more. But critically, it's not the case that there is a preference for you know, high values, for really complex interacting, uh, crisscrossing constraints in these constructions. Now, whether this is a fair characterization of dendrophilia, I don't know. What I do know is that there is no bias in these families towards uh, more complex syntax uh, when it comes to dependencies here operationalized through the notion of constraints. Right? There are other ways of operationalizing this, but clearly under this one, there is no tense. So what this suggests is that what we found in the, in the European case study on self-embedding might not be the reflex of a general dendrophilia of just like, you know, we want more complex syntax where uh, any tree construction is better than having no tree construction. It seems to be something more specific. Um, whether it's more general, uh, we have to be cautious here because we only tested in European, more needs to be tested, that's quite clear. But the current conclusion is that it's not general dendrophilia, it's a very specific preference for self-embedding. Now, where does this come from? One is tempted to uh, say that uh, it, this is something that emerged with language. I don't know. It certainly seems to be tied to the notion of labels and categories that we have here, because it is about self-similar embedding. So embedding the same in the same, noun phrases into noun phrases, not sentences and noun phrases. But one can also say this is only what we have seen so far, so maybe the case is not closed. But it's tempting to say it's got to do with that. And that's clearly something that we haven't seen in other communication systems outside humans, distinctions like noun, part of speech, uh, category degrees and so forth. But might it have built on an inherited capacity? And I think, yes, there is some evidence that there might be an inherited capacity for self-similar embedding. And this comes from uh, work that I think uh, Steve was involved in, uh, who talked uh, three weeks ago here, um, where they uh, looked at uh, the degree to which um, uh, uh, different participants and critically including uh, and, uh, uh, also a primate species, in this case, it was macaques, whether they would, uh, how they would produce uh, strings of different uh, computational complexity, regular, super regular, tail embedded, and so forth. And they found after a bit more training, um, uh, also uh, these monkeys would produce center embedded constructions which presuppose the kind of uh, self, uh, self similar embedding that we saw in language. So it is possible uh, that we build that here there was a capacity that it may have been latent because uh, what you see in experiment is not necessarily what is ecologically valid. It might have been a latent capacity that was recruited when categories came in like parts of speech, something which you know, uh, many people have said this, the, these categories come and go in languages and they are they, they evolve quite easily through uh, uh, standard processes of grammatical change. But when you have these categories in, combined with this capacity, that could possibly explain this self-preference for uh, self-similar embedding. 
Um, it needs to be tested. It's speculative, but at least here is a candidate for a mechanism in the or a characteristic of the language faculty that might have taken shape to the way we know it now, only when language evolved, but building on earlier resources. But it's very different from the first example, where the argument I made, the proposal I make, is that here language processing and from that language change is still affected by a bias that we share wholesale with other great apes. That's very different. Here it comes together with very specific linguistic functions. At least that's the uh, current hypothesis. Now, the last example, as I promised, is one where um, the, the biology of uh, language, the biologically underpinnings of language changed after uh, language emerged, not genetically, but developmentally. And this brings me uh, outside. Uh, we talked a lot about uh, semantics and syntax, but this brings me to phonology. Uh, and this is uh, a preference for a certain type of sound, the labidental, the f sound, uh, which emerged only much later than the language faculty, or was maybe put it in a better way, uh, the latest addition to the language faculty. And um, uh, what's at stake here is the following. This is work we did uh, quite a few years ago with, with uh, postdocs, um, uh, uh, Damian Blas in Sid Moran, um, where we uh, looked at the following uh, um, um, situation. Across primates, a standard developmental process is that the bite configuration changes uh, from uh, childhood to uh, adolescence uh, in such a way that you start out with what's called an over bite, where the uh, upper teeth are uh, positioned a little bit in front of the lower teeth. And over time, this changes into an edge-to-edge -edge bite, which you see on the right, where the two teeth are aligned. This is the natural development. And despite what your doctor and uh, you know dentists uh, nowadays say, this is there's nothing bad with the edge-to-edge, -edge, but in fact, this is what we should have. It's the healthier state. Uh, but something happened in human history. We invented agriculture. And this had a gigantic effect on everything, but it also had an effect on the, on the development of our bite configurations. With agriculture came uh, pre-processed food, maybe not, not like spongy McDonald's uh, stuff, but at least uh, softer food, food that needs less, uh, exerts less, uh, less uh, uh, tear and wear on the teeth. And uh, it was this tear and wear on the teeth that actually drives this natural development towards edge to edge bite. If you don't use the teeth to the extent that we are sort of biologically expected to do, then you stick, you keep going with this overbite position that we start out with. So the process is stopped. And we end up with these situations like on the right where you have extreme overbite and this is actually from an, ad from an advertisement. So people actually like it these days, that the most unnatural state. Now, when you are in this situation, something is done to our sound production systems. We did biomechanical simulation of what happens in the edge-to-edge uh, 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 -edge bite uh, situation that's on the right-hand side, and the over uh, overbite and uh, overjet, where you have a situation where the upper uh, teeth are in front of the lower teeth. What you get, uh, you get many effects, but one I want to focus on is like that, that the, uh, the distance between tooth and lip in P and F is virtually gone uh, in, the, in the overbite uh, condition. And it's uh, very much there in the edge to bite uh, situation, which suggests, as we uh, proposed, that there is uh, an easy um, you know, uh, room for error. Instead of pronouncing a P, you slip out the F because it's so close. And the listener can get used to this and pick up the F as the intended uh, sound rather than the P. If that happens, you get change. And in order to test this, um, uh, we uh, collected uh, cognate uh, sounds in, in the European, where we have uh, a very rich record of this. We know what's cognate. That's uh, fairly well established. We picked all cognate sets where you have of, of sounds, all cognate sounds, where well, we know that they changed into a F in at least one uh, branch. So the first 
is the famous Grimm law, right, where Germanic changed P to F in initial position. But many such changes happened uh, for a different sound. So when the reconstructed or Proto-Indo-European uh, changed into uh, the uh, in, in, in Latin uh, and, and, and so on. We coded this again. We, you, you saw it. We, we, it's the same strategy we applied to syntax in, in the other study. And then reconstructed the probabilities of having uh, a shift towards a labiodental pronunciation over time. And uh, I think it becomes clearer in this summary display where we trace each cognate sound for its probability of being pronounced as a labiodental. And there is an overall gradient where this increased, and it fits exactly what we predict from um, the spreads of technology, of food producing technology, where uh, more pre-processed food became more and more available uh, for speakers. And uh, so tear and wear on the teeth goes down. So they overbite uh, bite configurations increase in probability, which then in turn increases the probability of changing from uh, some sound, usually it's a ba, but it can also be a qua or whatnot, uh, to a labidental. And uh, the hypothesis also predicts that hunter-gatherer populations who are less exposed, not not, but less exposed to softer food would have fewer labidentals. And indeed, um, that was also the case on a global database that we in, uh, examined um, statistically. So then uh, I would like to conclude with that and just to wrap up with uh, some final remarks. Um, I think the take home message that I would like to uh, make here is that if we want to describe the dynamics of the language phenotype, as I think we must, because that's one of the core characteristics of this phenotype, then we need to combine comparative experiments. And by comparative, I both mean cross-cultural and cross-species on mechanisms of how language is operated by us through production, processing, and learning. We need to combine this with phylogenetic modeling of the effects of these mechanisms of language change. I call this diachronic biases. It doesn't matter. The point is that it's a dynamic characteristic of the language faculty. And I think no description of the language faculty is ever complete unless we capture and describe and characterize this dynamic uh, and understand what shapes it, what biases drive it, uh, what it's uh, built into. And uh, I think we have some tentative evidence uh, uh, where uh, these biases, in one case, arose earlier than language. I think that's the animate agent preference. I don't know when it originated, but I believe it certainly um, uh, uh, antedates the great apes. Maybe it's also there in other uh, primates. Maybe it's even there in other mammals. Who knows? But it's something specific about animate agents. It's not just causality detection that you find maybe in every neural system. I don't know. It's very widespread. Uh, a second case where it's boosted by language, that's very speculative, uh, but it seems like there is an earlier uh, capacity for self-similar embedding, but combined with language, it turns into a bias. It's not general dendrophilia. It's not the general drive towards complex syntax. It seems to be more specific. And then finally, a bias that arose later than uh, language. It arose only very recently, in fact, only about uh, only in the Neolithic, so only about like since uh, 10, 8,000 years ago, and only through the spread of uh, uh, changes in our diet, which in turn uh, uh, interrupted a natural development in our uh, uh, teeth configuration from childhood to adulthood, uh, and that changed the probabilities of a certain class of sounds, namely the labidentals, as the latest addition to the human language faculty, and not even universal, because it's tied to this very specific uh, mechanism uh, in our sound production system. So this is what I would like to uh, conclude with. And uh, obviously, I'm very much looking forward to questions. Thank you very much for your attention.
Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks for a fantastic talk, Ambassador. So as, as in previous weeks, we're going to come to um, questions from our invited panel first. So maybe Isabel, could I invite you to um, question, comment? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. It was great to see all of that uh, combined together. Uh, I really loved the new work on the uh, agent preference, of course, for obvious reason. Um, I just want to uh, like like leave comments about the fact. Um, so th th there's been a lot of uh, evidence for exactly this causal detection in other species, but uh, like not the agent of a patient type of attention or preference. It, it's like, it, it's, a, it's, it's a little bit different than just causal detection. And I just wanted to add that, that it's, it's um, in our study that I showed last week, it's mm -hmm. really not causal detection. It's really mm -hmm. about the same agent of a, of a patient, but that's just a detail. Mm -hmm. Uh, what I, I, I love the, the the study you presented on apes, and I, I would like really to know more about this, but w w what I wanted to ask you was that, um, so at the, like before presenting all that, you show that the studies on emerging sign language, mm -hmm. where you said that that's actually the reverse that happened, that mm -hmm. the preferred like uh, to use, that's the golden meadow study, that they prefer to use the objects uh, first, the patient first, sorry. And then um, the the Mayer et al. study where uh, in some circumstances you have like an equal proportion. So mm. like if this we have this like general cognitive agent, animate agent bias, how do we explain that? Well, I think, I, I, I don't know. It's a good question. Uh, Everything I see in in production, we have also done a series of production studies on 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 these issues, like whether you know um, uh, how the planning goes for a nominative that could be agent or patient, or for an ergative that can only be patient so, uh, agent and so forth. All I see from production, and we're talking really production data here, all I see is that there are two principles at stake only. One is just spit out what you want to say first. You know, just like, I mean, many people have claimed this as a principle, and I think it's, uh, you see this all over. And the second thing is like, you want to be fast because you've got to plan before, you know, your terms up, your, your turn comes up. And so uh, spitting out nominatives, for instance, is great, right? Because it doesn't commit you. And uh, uh, using an ergative first, for instance, is problematic because it immediately sticks you into a transitive, uh, active uh, syntax frame. Um, not so good to change your mind while you, you know, still sort out your incremental plans. So uh, uh, now to your question, I think whether or not there is a universal bias in production to produce patients first, I don't know whether it actually really has to do with patient. I think it has to do with like what's most of most interest. So if uh, if in in this data that that we saw, like it's like the. the what was the example? Uh, cookie eat you, right? The cookie is the interesting stuff, not the co-present addressee. And in the mayor et al. study, is the human object. I and mean, there is a general preference to name humans, right? That is uh, conspecifics. That's cool. You put them out first. So I think production is very much uh, driven by these things. And the agent preference has nothing to do with it. I think it's really for production. It just doesn't matter, not at all. Uh, it, and and, and the, the reason I'm saying this is precisely because when language, when speakers produce patients first, even then, as comprehend as they expect an agent, right? It's it's it goes against the language. It's a it's a bias that you know things like languages are crazy. They shouldn't do what they do, but they still do it. And we just we are stubborn. We expect agents, even when we don't like to produce them first. So that's um, sorry for the long answer. No, 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 that's cool. I, I, I'm just agnostic about it. I was just asking. Mm -hmm. I, I told the boo. Um, yeah, for the rest, I need to wrap up my head around it. So please, uh, the rest of you go. Steve, maybe we'll come to you next. Yeah, sure. Um, that that was a, a really wonderful talk. All that stuff is is very cool. Um, um, I guess I was wondering if you could say a bit about the kind of functional pressures for self embedding, or like yeah. what are the things that are making languages change? Do you think? Um, 
Yeah, this is really uh, uh, the, the the thing I, I know least about that I'm less uh, least sure about. I I I do see so this work that that you guys did with the uh, with the attacks on uh, learning um, uh, center embedded uh, bracket structures in production, which I thought was really nice because it's you know uh, you see what they do. Uh, I thought this was like. Um, gives evidence of uh, at least the capacity for doing that. Now, when does it turn into a bias for liking to do it? Uh, and I think, and this is really speculative, it might have to do just with the fact that um, uh, embedding the same in the same is somewhat the simplest solution. So, you know, you don't have to change gears, you don't have to adjust categories, you have simply one rule. I mean, people have argued that's that's the benefit of recursion, right? You have just uh, one rule and you can do everything, right? Uh, while otherwise you have to do much more construction, uh, you know, small pieces and bits. But uh, I don't know, I don't think anyone has done the right experiments to, to really tease these apart. Adele, come to you now. Thank you. Um, this was absolutely fabulous talk. I was riveted. Um, and, uh, you know, I, well, my my primary question sort of echoes Isabel. If, if um, I, I totally believe you that animate agents are, the, you know, draw our attention more than anything else, for sure. Why are there stable uh, languages that express the object first? Is it that they don't express the, they tend not to express um, the agent because it tends to be more given? Like, are they in actuality more frequently OS? Or why, like, yeah. what's the explanation for those? Mm. Well, now I'm making a bold claim. I think actually most languages would like to do that. Uh, a uh, object first, most salient, most important things first, humans first, and the agent. That the, the, so the the claim would be the, uh, the the semantic roles make little contribution to how you order your sentences in production. So now, I'm sorry, uh, but are you saying um, sort of like what, focus first then? Uh, it could be focus, could be like uh, uh, whatever is uh, most of most interest, what, what needs to be named first. So in that sense, yes, what provides most information so that the thing that is more rheumatic or more uh, I mean, terminologies go and come or more focus indeed and not topical. What's presupposed you mentioned later because, I mean, who cares? You most often even drop it in most languages anyway, right? So... Um, <clears throat> that will be and, the... and do you, but do you see that as at odds then with the animate agent preference? Is that is no, that? No, my point is that that uh, the animate agent preference is really only a parsing strategy, and it's actually one that is almost dysfunctional for language. So languages prefer to put anything else but uh, agents first. I mean, many languages indeed uh, do that. You you know the the lexical noun phrase first, object whatnot, and then oftentimes it is a patient. And uh, so the animate agent preference clashes with it because you, you but, and that was what, what I find so striking about the Ainu uh, experimental results that in a language where the grammar, everything tells you it's got to be a patient and the brain still thinks no. Now, one way of mitigating this is to make sure that you at least don't have a case system where the unmarked noun phrase is constantly a patient. You know, so that the unmarked noun phrase then develops into one, the nominative is an agent denoting noun phrase. And that's why, that's what I think explains this bias that we see in language change against ergatives. Because ergative systems really are, you know, ergative combined with object initial is the worst for the processing system. Now the object initial you can't really get rid of because, you know, there is another principle in production to spit out the most important uh, lexical stuff first. But case, who cares, right? It doesn't contribute anything to meaning. It's just like, yeah, you know, conventions. But there you can fix the system, so to speak, right? You can, uh, by, by getting away from argatives, you have at least unmarked NPs that in most cases denote agents. As passives and stuff are different, but in most cases it's agent. At least you the, the, the problem is mitigated a bit, right? So I, I think in that sense, it's a, 
um, it's a compromise solution that uh, that we have here. And and just a quick follow up. Um, you you use sort of traditional terms like nominative case and the language faculty and but but you could understand what you're saying to mean that you don't need to use nominative. You're you're talking about the unmarked noun in yeah. a you know. <laughs> Right? Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, but by nominative, I simply mean what's also the, the, the form used for naming things. Okay. No. Right. Okay. Yeah. No, thank Just you. Just very, yeah, very traditional, but unmarked or absolutely, I don't know. So, That's it. Okay. Good. Yeah. Okay. So I've, I've, got a, I've got a queue of um, questions from people online. If there's questions in the room, wave at me during the next the next answer. And I'll come to you. So the, there's a couple of questions online about um, ergodicity. So I'm actually going to ask two of them. So the first one is a clarification one, and then the second one is um, is, is a bit more in depth. So the, the clarification question is from Sampraya Basu, and she says, "Thank you for the talk. And when you say ergodic models are good for modeling language, is the idea that you have in theory a station distribution?" That languages should be evolving towards. So, are languages evolving towards some ideal distribution of features? Is that what you mean when you talk about ergodicity? Well, the actual uh, stationary probabilities can be very different, and often they are very different from one language family to the next. It doesn't have to be always the same. When you have a bias of the kind I propose, I would expect it to converge across language families and to be always the same. But otherwise, no, I don't think that's necessary. Uh, all that's necessary is the assumption of ergodicity, which is sort of an assumption that I guess one makes in historical linguistics anyway all the time, uh, because uh, nobody would expect that a certain state can never be left again. Okay, That's and then the, the, the second question about um, ergodicity and, and stationary distributions is from Simon Kirby. He says, great talk, thank you. Uh, regarding ergodicity stationarity, I wonder what you think about two plausible counterexamples namely emerging sign languages and claim differences between esoteric and esoteric languages, um, or similar cases where extra-linguistic cultural factors influence language dynamics. Yeah, <clears throat> I think all these extra-linguistic factors, as I tried also to emphasize in the first part of the talk, really impact uh, the, the distribution of features a, a great deal. Um, they change the, the transition rates, they change the stationary probabilities. If you look at the specific language family in a specific region, certainly these change, these things uh, matter, but it doesn't, it, it, it just changes the probabilities, but not the fact that you converge on a certain probability when time goes on. Um, emergent sign languages, um, uh, that's, there is a debate, obviously, whether the state space of sign languages is the same as that of spoken languages. Apart from the actual sound system, I haven't seen any evidence for a difference in the total state space. I think that's the, the total state space seems to be virtually identical in syntax and semantics. If that's the case, then I find it difficult to imagine a situation where it actually would not be ergodic. So any state in that state space should be reachable. Now, the problem is, of course, we don't have enough time that has elapsed. In, in uh, most, so in, in my experience it, with, with these models, language change is relatively fast in, for instance, in syntax uh, and, and uh, or morphology and these things, it's relatively fast. It usually reaches stationarity faster than the time that's of the, of the language trees that we have. But that's still, we don't have uh, uh, language trees of 8,000 years in sign languages. So we might never see it. That is, that is uh, clearly a, a, a problem that we have an empirical one, a data problem. Okay, and then two two related questions. One's from John Mansfield online, then I had a, a follow-up. So so I think we're both puzzling over your IWU data and the N400 that, that you're seeing um, with those guys. So John Mansfield's question is, um, is there IWU corpus evidence on typical ways of encoding animate patients? How does that work? Sorry, I didn't quite uh, understand. Right. Is, is there IWU corpus evidence on typical ways of encoding animate patients? The corpus, uh, 
Well, it just, I mean, we did this corpus uh, survey and, and modeling only to, to validate the claims from the syntactic analysis, that the syntactic analysis, like say, that's, that the default construction is uh, patient first. And we just wanted to see whether this is also the case in a corpus, because you could also just drop the noun phrase. You could start with a verb uh, and, and just wanted to make, make sure. So it's, uh, it's just a validation. Okay, and then my, my question on that same study is how do you, what, I think maybe you, you, you skimmed these details, but how do you know that the N400 for Iowa speakers is indexing the same kind of reanalysis that it, that it does for German speakers or English speakers or something like that? It's, what's your, why are you so confident that, that actually this is just yeah. signaling something apparently very strange? Yes, I mean, the... <clears throat> uh... Ideally, we would want to test this against uh, predictions from surprisal from a, a language model of IVU. We don't have it, the data is not rich enough. What makes me confident though, is that the uh, surface frequencies, there's the raw frequencies, or it's not quite raw, it's estimated after controlling for all sorts of things. What we find is that the probability distribution of patient initial uh, noun of, of initial patients mirrors what we saw in Hindi and Basque. Uh, and that suggests to me that even if one were to fit and were able to fit the big language model on IWU, I would be surprised if, if the, the results would be so different. So I would be surprised if surprisal would explain the N400 in IWU. But I, it's true, I, we cannot completely uh, uh, rule it out. Okay, and then We've got time for for one last question. Unless any of the panelists want to jump in, I'm going to ask I'm going to ask a final question, which is um, at the start you were very um, you were very positive about um, inferring biases from from phylogenetics, um, and and basically you said the only problem is a, a, a data problem. But then the, for me, the fantastic thing about your talk is that you're delving into the different mechanisms that shape languages. And that's, it seems to me like that's the one thing that just inferring the, 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 the directions of change from phylogenetics can't speak to. So you've just got this big complex process that spits out these regularities and you don't know what the mechanisms are. So I just wondered how you reconcile the, your positivity about the phylogenetic approach at the start with the work you're actually doing on like what mechanisms are driving these um, patterns. How, how I square this with... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 would you be happy if we could do everything just by reconstruction from phylogenetics, or do you actually care more about the oh, mechanisms? Yeah. Oh, I think I, I really, I mean, a, I would be very happy if we knew the the distribution of linguistic features in the Paleolithic. I would be make super happy. That would be fantastic. Uh, but uh, I, I do think that um, I am most interested in mechanisms. I'm, I'm not so interested in like what specific structures you find here and there, uh, but really about the mechanisms. That's why I, I really want to understand any bias, any preference that we find really in terms of where it comes from in the processing system. It's got to be there. It's, it's a brain issue. And that's what I, I, I want to, I, I think is very important to understand. Also, like if you talk about like the biological origins of the of the of, of language, right? It has to come from something that happened in our brains, and uh, that that's and that means mechanisms. Okay, fantastic. So um, I think we've got through most of the questions. So now we're going to wrap up. Um, normally, at this point, somebody else magically in the room changes the slides that are on display, but maybe not today. Um, so next week's talk is the final talk in the series, and our final speaker is going to be um, Adele Goldberg. So let's thank Balthazar uh, for a fantastic talk. And it's um, same same time, same place uh, next week for the final talk here is um, by Adele Goldberg. Okay, so we'll see you all then. Well, thank you all for listening and for the great questions. It was fantastic. Thanks. Right. Thank you, Master. Right. Right. Cheers, guys. See you next week. Hey.